All right, Darren, I'm bringing you in in three, two, one. Et voila. Sir, do we do it like this? No, we'll back out a little bit. Uh, how are you doing? Great. Great to be here again. The, it was, it's, well, when was the, it was once before, a long time ago. And we talked about, we're going to talk about by and large, you know, a similar, what we talked about last time, uh, but it's been revamped now. But Darren, for those who don't know who you are, um, and we're not going to go over the childhood thing like we did the last time, but who, who are you for those who missed the first stream? Everyone should go watch it. But who are you? 30,000 foot overview. Absolutely. I'm Darren Beatty, a uh, former speechwriter for President Trump, former Duke professor of political theory, and currently the founder of Revolver News, the most cutting edge place for investigative work challenging the regime and the national security state and one of the best aggregators around to boot, that's revolver.news. Now, uh, how, how long has Revolver been around? It's actually quite young comparatively. It's not even three years old. Um, its launch date, I believe, was July 1st, 2020. So Revolver, so what, what the website again? Still a baby, on? still a baby. How many people work there? Like how many, how many journalists do you have? And uh, what's, what's the size of the enterprise? It's it's a bootstrap enterprise, um, like two two and a half full time you know uh, employees. I mean, two and a half employees. I guess you could say maybe two full time, three full time. It's a very very small operation, a very effective operation. It's an elite unit. It's the uh, SEAL Team Six of journalism and. With our extremely modest budget, we've been able to completely shape um, the national narrative and the national conversation on a variety of really important issues, um, including and perhaps most famously um, about January 6th, the, what, what I call the January 6th fed surrection not the insurrection the the fed surrection who, who who first coined that i mean i know that i've been hearing that but were, were you do, do you know if you were that's true that's a revolver news term that's that's us so uh actually before we get into the january 6th story so just explain how do you how do you go about starting revolver news and for those who you know who might have the ambition of doing something similar what goes into starting something like that like how do you get started how do you find financing uh and how do you make money while you do it you know, it's, it's really, it's really tough. And, uh, you know, this is, I'm not inherently a businessman. I think inherently what I was supposed to be is a kind of aloof academic. It's what I'm best suited for. Unfortunately, academia is not really conducive to uh, people who should be academics in the proper sense, but that's, you know, that's a story for another, another time. Um, so just, kind of as a fluke. It's something that I fell into. And um, it's uh, kind of the the throb of inspiration initially was the fact that the Drudge Report has, had taken such um, an unfortunate and radical turn for the worse. And as I mentioned, Revolver has killer aggregation. And that's originally kind of what it was set up to be, but then it evolved into something much more in kind of an unanticipated fashion. It became, I would say, one of the leading in investigative reporting um, websites, uh, not just on the conservative side, but but more generally. And I will say it's it's not an easy thing to do. It's a first first business. Like I said, I'm not a history, you know, don't have a history of starting businesses, first business and in a very, very difficult terrain. It's just, it is not the most advisable business model um, to repeatedly irritate, aggravate the FBI and other extremely <laughs> powerful institutions. It's simply not the best business model. And it can be a huge pain in the ass. And I and now that, you know, Tucker's been in the news and he's been great and, you know, an exemplar, I think, of what somebody in the media with a national perch should be. Um, just a qu quick anecdote is I remember an occasion I was on Tucker's show. He was congratulating our reporting for January 6th. And in a certain sense, I said, OK, well, 
as far as the news business goes, it doesn't get much better than this. Here's the number one cable news host praising our work and before an audience of millions. Um, apart from just satisfying the ego, this has to be good for business, right? Well, the next day, as you know, I, I guess an, an example of what happens when you become somewhat influential, the next day we were banned from Google ads. And therefore, what should have been like a great time in terms of, you know, business, you know, in any other context and some prominent person is, you know, praising your work, that's good for business. In the media, it's very different. It's a completely different um, uh, kind of endeavor when you're swimming against the current, um, which in this case, we most certainly were. And so, there have been full-time George Soros funded people who have, you know, with the, with the vigor and attentiveness and the kind of sociopathy of an obsessive ex would look at every little time we, there's some new advertiser that appeared, this, this woman would just freak out and send a bunch of emails to whoever was on the other end saying, are you sure you want to do business with a conspiracy theory, Trump side and this and that, you know, with no substantiation, it's like, you know, this person who has, you know, no credentials, no achievement, no record of original thought, and who doesn't even bother to give an explanation as to what's so objectionable about the site. All you need to use is a couple buzzwords and, you know, the poor, you know, whatever, probably 25 year old, woman on the other end of the line who has, you know, a master's in marketing or whatever, um, just sees those buzzwords and she's like, oops, this is naughty stuff, um, you know, liability. And then, you know, they cut you off and it's just one big headache after another. And so luckily we've been able to, after a long laborious work, um, repair some of this and, and develop direct um, advertising relationships, but the, the encumbrances and the headaches are something like, you know, I could never have imagined, um, on top of the fact we had, you know, emails when we first launched, we were popular from the very start. We got something like, you know, close to a quarter million email signups and we were quickly canceled from over four different email services, the kind of services like MailChimp that you use to send out mass emails. So I had to start up my own thing, literally with, you know, we have our own, you know, server, we have the whole infrastructures uh, for ourselves. And so now we can finally send email, but something as rudimentary as that to think of the headache that it uh, <laughs> the headache to go through to set up something on your own like that. So now we are sending emails. So for people listening to this, sign up. Um, we're going to try to build this again and get to a million email signups now that we have our own robust infrastructure. So heads up, revolver.news, sign up for the email. But the long, you know, the long story short to answer your question is you're, it's just a different world. If, if it's, it's not supposed to happen to be able to, um, you know, to, to really criticize the regime um, uh, in an effective way. That's not supposed to happen. But what's really not supposed to happen is to be able to make a living criticizing and exposing and embarrassing the regime. That's really not supposed to happen. And there are a variety of of pretty brutal mechanisms in place to make somebody's life difficult who um, who endeavors to do that. That being said, I think it's great. You know, I'm not being forced to do it. I do it because it's invigorating, it's important, it's fun. Um, and so far it's been very successful, but it's not necessarily something that I would recommend to people who, uh, uh, <laughs> who don't want to endure all of these headaches because even like myself there, you know, there are a million other things I could be doing and maybe should be doing, um, you know, again, you know, if, if, if it were a different world, I probably should have some academic perch where I would continue to write about Heidegger, which is the subject of intense interest. I dedicated my entire twenties to philosophy, reading it and, and to writing it. But, you know, 
uh, things turn out uh, uh, it, to be more interesting than you'd expect sometimes. And so here I am as as the uh, founder of Revolver News and uh, somebody who's become kind of an expert or authority on the January 6th Fed surrection of all topics. Dude, we're we're going to get into that. I'll have a few more <laughs> I'll have a few more questions uh related to other stuff afterwards, but let's make sure we can get into this. Okay. First of all, who who was the the primary journalist or the primary person covering investigating January 6th? At Revolver. This is it's you, correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. I'm... Now where did where, like Let's say, how do you start off? You see, January six happens. What, uh -huh. what are you What are you thinking the day it happens, and when When do you start looking into this, and where do you start uh, looking into it to find what you think is the truth? Well, you know, we've been on January six for, for a long time, really close to the beginning, before the whole sort of Fed surrection narrative um, blew up, and that I think our first major piece on that was around June. Um, but before that, we had gained uh, a pretty fair uh, deal of attention for our coverage of the case of Brian Sicknick. And uh, we had a really big piece called MAGA Blood Libel. And that was really about the fact that all of the reporting on January 6th was calling it deadly, not because of what happened to Ashley Babbitt, but because there was this Capitol Police officer, Brian Sicknick, who at the time was reported to have been bludgeoned to death by the mob with a fire extinguisher. And so we went, you know, as we've been known to do very deep dives, and we did a deep dive into these reports and said, you know, this is uh, a total fabrication. There's simply no evidence whatsoever that Brian Sicknick was bludgeoned with a fire extinguisher, it's it's totally false. And the media responded um, and shifted its narrative. Uh, they shifted their narrative to uh, Brian Sicknick dying as a result of bear spray that was deployed against him by the mob. And we took that narrative on and basically uh, refuted it um, using uh, a variety of tools, including a kind of comparative image analysis using heat maps, showing that the specific New York Times reporting uh, suggesting that these particular individuals use bear spray that ultimately um, uh, uh, injured Brian Sicknick, that that couldn't have been the bear spray. And then finally, after that, um, the New York Times and the rest of the media changed its story yet another time and finally um, kind of begrudgingly admitted that Brian Sicknick died of natural causes, which is now sort of the official and accepted version, but not without all of that initial damage having been done of saying the bloody uh, MAGA mob, the murderous mob, the deadly insurrection, all of that. All of that terminology really emerges from the false um, narrative, that initial false narrative of Brian Sicknick. And there's still kind of an ambiguity there as to how um, the case of Sicknick is talked about by um, by very prominent elected officials. Well, I, there, there was Biden. one guy, there was one guy, I forget his name now, but in Congress or in, in, in the, I forget where he was, but a politician in, in government saying, Referring to Sicknick as the guy that was murdered at the at the uh, at the at the January sixth. Two two questions right. though on 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 Sicknick in particular actually. Mm -hmm. The first one is from a National Review article. They said that people who knew knew from day one he was not bludgeoned to death with a fire extinguisher because that's not the type of thing that you can make a mistake on. Um, right. Period. And then the second one, before I forget, you know, the stroke, natural causes, and I want to ask if you know anything or anyone has any suspicions about that potentially being. COVID jab related because we're at the point in time where everyone there had to be double vaccinated or were and whether or not that panned out or anyone had looked into that aspect. But starting with the first one, who knew as of when um, that the, the Sicknick was not bludgeoned to death with a fire extinguisher? Well, I would imagine that uh, any of the variety of mainstream outlets that reported this, if they had done the very basic due diligence, would have known that. I mean, I don't have any insight as to, into the actual like due diligence that they may or may not have done. But as you pointed out, it's it's not 
it, it's not a very um, uh, it, it's 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 hard to get that wrong to put it that way. It's it's uh, it's hard to see how that could be an innocent mistake, but um, whether or not the initial mistake was innocent, the um, uh, dilatory manner in which it was ultimately corrected, I think is certainly not innocent. And the manner in which that original mischaracterization simply spread and continued to dominate the way that people in the news and elected officials spoke about the death of Sicknick and January 6th more generally, I think that is, is very damning, very malicious, and very much politically motivated in order to kind of amplify the severity of this um, event on January 6, which the entire media and the regime, I would say it's fair to say, wanted to amplify this into something serious enough that could serve as a pretext for further weaponization of uh, the national security bureaucracies and the Justice Departments uh, politically against Trump supporters and people who question uh, official narratives and mobilize on the basis of those questions, like you know what happened in January six and other sort of protests against the uh, outcome of the twenty twenty election. Just going to read this. I keep bringing this up. This is still on the internet. He dreamed of being a police officer, then was killed by a pro Trump mob. Right, the death of Brian Sick. But and you know what's more amazing? Look at this down here. Update. New information has emerged regarding the death of the Capitol Police Officer Brian Sicknick that questions the initial cause of his death provided by officials close to the Capitol, and yet they still keep the article up with that absolutely maliciously dishonest headline. Um, All the propaganda that's fit to print. This is the state media. That's the thing. There's all this controversy with Elon Musk. Is he going to, you know, label NPR state, you know, state funded media, this or that? It's it's amazing how sensitive these institutions are to that specific challenge, because beneath it all, um, exempting, you know, certain formalities in every meaningful functional sense. Uh, the New York Times, 60 Minutes, all of what we've come to call the mainstream media is effectively state media. Um, and so, you know, they don't have to, because they're state media and their purpose is propaganda, they simply don't have to play by the ordinary rules of kind of uh, ethical journalistic conduct. Had anyone looked into, and I don't want to sound like I say a conspiracy theory, but you know, it's only in hindsight now that we've seen how many strokes have been attributed to the jabs. Did anybody look into that? Did anyone look into when Sicknick might have been jabbed and the proximity of that to his death by stroke? I have not looked into that just because I think there's a lot more downside than upside at this point. I I take the victory of the media at least conceding that it was natural causes. Um, and so Further than that, um, I haven't really, I haven't really delved into it. Um, at least not to the level that I'm prepared to speak publicly on it. But um, I think it's sufficient just to note this is how desperate they were from the very beginning for a particular narrative on January six. And I think the fact that we got in there so early to um, refute that false narrative, I really, I, I think, I it helped to keep the door open for further reevaluation of January 6. Because with these things, if, if you let the false narrative crystallize, once it's crystallized and it becomes this kind of, you know, uh, sacred thing, you, you, it's, it's very hard to challenge. And so you have to get in very early before it's crystallized and it has this kind of aura of, um, invincibility and a kind of sacred character that you can't touch. And I think it was very important to get in there early before that initial wave of, um, of uh, the false narratives around January 6 was able to, to really uh, do its permanent damage. Um, the, the, there were a number of suicides that were attributed to, you know, the police officers in the wake of January 6th. Did, had, had you delved into that at all either? Because I was I was actually, I mean, I don't know how many Capitol police officers work for the Capitol that that number could make any sense. But mm -hmm. it, it sounded like a big number. It sounded like they were really harping on that as a narrative as well. 
had you looked into that or do you have any information on that that I haven't looked into that and again that's the kind of thing that you know I just leave alone because um I think it's probably you know not that I have reason to suspect anything uh off there but that's definitely the kind of territory that if you look into it it's it's very easy to to become the victim of very aggressive lawfare techniques and you know we can talk about this because uh, Ray Epps amazingly has retained this uh, lawyer who works for a uh, disgraced Democrat hatchet man, David Brock. And he's gotten this lawyer to kind of throw around, uh, you know, lawsuit, defamation lawsuit threats against uh, Tucker Carlson and Revolver News and so forth. And I think, you know, well, it remains to be seen whether they'll follow through with that. But uh, Ray Epps is one case. I think it's very difficult for them to do with Ray Epps because he's such an unsympathetic figure and his case is so manifestly ridiculous because so much of what we claimed is on camera. And he himself has been exposed through his text messages of having described his own behavior in terms that are far more quote unquote defamatory than anything <laughs> that I've ever said. He literally texted his nephew and said, quote unquote, I orchestrated it. Um, well, so, let's, let's get yeah. into that now because it's, it's, it's like, you know, truth is the absolute defense to claims and defamation. And I guess someone can't defame themselves. So Ray Epps is, is judgment proof, uh, at least re as relates to his own admissions of his own conduct. W when do you, for, when do you find out about Ray Epps as the, as the individual? Like when do, when do these videos start trickling in and how do you, how does he get identified? When's the first time you identify him by name? Well, the Ray Epps story came a little bit later. I don't remember exactly when our Ray Epps part one piece came out. I mean, people can Google it. That's the the classic series now is Meet Ray Epps. And then there's a Meet Ray Epps part two, which is the real classic. And it has pretty astonishing video, not only of Ray Epps, but of a host of other curious characters who played um, collectively, I'd say a decisive role in laying out the preconditions for January 6th to turn into what it did. And none of these people have been um, arrested and in many cases haven't even, even been identified. I've spoken about this individual referred to as scaffold commander. Um, I think it's a very, very um, bizarre case of someone whose behavior was just as egregious, if not more so than Epps, who hasn't even been identified yet. Um, and I've devoted a considerable amount of resources to identifying him with no success. And so I would love to know who this person is, for one, uh, but his identity, along with so many other things, remains a mystery to this day. And how did you find out how did you find Ray Epps's by name? Like, was it the aggregate knowledge of the internet? People were posting clips. Yeah, and I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on in the internet. Ironically, a lot of this stuff comes from sort of very um, active and thorough sort of left wing researchers who, you know, did these very comprehensive files on all these people related to January 6th, because in their view, all these people are Trump loving fascists. And they think, you know, their working theory about people like Epps is the reason they're not charged is the government's just full of Trump loving fascists, then they're protecting the insurrectionists, like the notion that there's you know, a different aspect of the story, or that maybe the government isn't such a friend of uh, Trump and his supporters, and the government maybe did something to set them up, or, you know, that's totally outside of their worldview because you know all of the power centers are far right you know neo-nazi trump you know trump aligned and um they're just you know these these brave leftists speaking truth to power and you know the cognitive dissonance uh of the fact that every single powerful institution in the country is basically on that their side that that hasn't really sunk in yet because I think it would be really devastating their political psychology. They can't admit that they're kind of working at, at on behalf of the regime. Uh, so there's there's really kind of a weird dynamic there. But um, notwithstanding all of that, uh, they're they've done some valuable research in terms of you know getting 
collecting the footage that there is on people like Scaffold Commander and, and so forth. They're just not able to put it together, I think, in a um, realistic and coherent and compelling narrative. Um, so you, you gather, I mean, you, you scrutinize the internet, you get all these videos, you start putting it together. When do you decide that you're doing the deep dive into Ray Epps and January 6th? I mean, is, is it in, in the one or two months or is it six? I forget when it came out. Is it six months later? And how long does it take you to scrutinize all of the evidence that's submitted to you to put together the part one of meet Ray Epps? It, you know, it takes a while because we want it to be very thorough and people will see that Meet Ray Epps part one and part two are extremely thorough works of journalism um, and very long. But, you know, these are meant to kind of stand the test of time. They're still getting tons of views. They've become sort of the uh, the go to for people who want to crash course in the uh, in the Fed's direction. I say at this point. There are two smoking guns of the Fed direction. One is the story of Ray Epps, and the other one is the story of the January 5th and 6th pipe bombs that we've also covered um, extensively. And there are so many other areas of January 6th that I'm aware of just as a consumer of media, but I just haven't had the time and the bandwidth to, to go deep in, and other people are doing it, you know, uh, there are claims of you know people opening doors and you know the Columbus doors. There are, there are all kinds of other aspects to the story. Everything is going on on the east side of the Capitol, um, but Revolver's focus has been chiefly on that initial breach on the west perimeter of the Capitol, um, in which Ray Epps was certainly involved. Um, and uh, the pipe bomb issue. Okay, actually, and stop it there because I, we've talked about the pipe bomb multiple times, but not in thorough, meaningful detail. Tell the world what the controversy was over the pipe bombs. My my rec my memory is that this was another one of the initial narratives. Pipe bombs were found outside. I forget which building, and then it was never spoken of again. And the suspicion is that the pipe bombs never existed, and it was just a total lie. Or were there actual pipe bombs? And nobody found out who put them there. No, I mean, there were pipe bombs. So this, to get into the full version, um, just because we have limited time, it, 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 it takes a while. But I have, I've been on the record. I've been multiple uh, interviews. We have multiple pieces on it. So I just encourage people, go to Revolver.News, go to the exclusives, go look at the pipe bomb stuff. It was, we have a bunch of stuff. The long story short on the pipe bomb issue is that... Um, the circumstances under which the RNC pipe bomb was found, the circumstances under which the DNC pipe bomb was not found until it was, those independently are kind of infinitesimally low probabilities. And both of those independent low probabilities had to happen together in order for the official version uh, to be true. We've And apart from analyzing those aspects we've also done forensic analysis of the surveillance footage given to us by the fbi of this supposed pipe bomber we showed that the fbi is withholding critical footage that's in its possession that would depict the pipe bomber actually planting the bomb which is relevant because the dnc bomb was allegedly sitting out there for 17 hours undiscovered when um, there are a ton of motorists, a ton of pedestrians. We showed that there was a physical security guard stationed no more than 10 feet away from it. And the big one is that the Secret Service of the United States swept that entire area and is on record as having done so uh, because Kamala Harris was in the building while the pipe bomb was there. And the Secret Service managed to miss this pipe bomb sitting right out there in the, out in the open. Their dogs managed not to smell the explosive devices that are allegedly part of the pipe bomb, the powder. The dogs had COVID, I guess, so they didn't have the sense of smell that day. So they're just one thing compounded on top of another that's implausible. And so on top of all that, it is kind of weird that uh, the FBI censored the, the, the piece of footage that we know that they have, we prove that they have, uh, uh, that would show definitively that the bomb was actually planted there at the time that they said it was. Um, so okay. there are a lot of things going on with the pipe bomb. Uh, one specific thing that I've called upon all of these sort of congressional committees to, uh, to take action on 
is to get the full chain of custody and the full raw unedited footage of the DNC uh, surveillance tapes um, that the FBI used. And, you know, they did a lot of dirty things like they slowed down the frame rate to 1.4 frames per second, something like that, which is unheard of. So there's so many dimensions to it, but it's a whole different universe. There are interesting areas of overlap uh, between the Epp story and the and the pipe bomb story. Uh, but for the most part, they're separate domains. And to get into the pipe bomb stuff could, you know, would take probably an hour and a half to even give a, an, a, uh, an adequate summarized version of all the key points pertaining to the pipe bombs. Then I'm, then I'm going to have to invite you back, Darren, because I, 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 I would like to get into that. Okay, Ray Epson, let's deal with Ray Epps. Um, he, along with Scaffold Man, Scaffold Man still unidentified. Ray Epps was on the FBI's most wanted list, mm -hmm. um, was removed from it. I forget if he was removed like the, the next day, the next week, or if it was a longer period of a time. A long later. time. No, that's the thing. It took a long time. He was removed right after Revolver's reporting on potential federal involvement started to gain national attention. Uh -huh. He was removed very quietly. We actually, again, I don't have this off the top of my head, but uh, we actually interpolated using the Wayback Machine to within like a five minute margin exactly when it was removed. So um, again, people just go to revolver.news, read read the Ray Epps series, and you can, you can see that. But the fact that he was uh, included in the first place, I think is important for a variety of reasons. One is it showed that his behavior was pretty egregious. I mean, he's the only person caught on camera as early as January 5th, urging people in this seemingly like rehearsed, methodical fashion of saying, I'm probably going to go to jail for this. I know I shouldn't say this. I'm probably going to get arrested for this. But Tomorrow, we need to go into the Capitol, into the Capitol, that sort of thing. Um, he's doing that on camera on the 5th, and it's not like he has this one-off idea that's kind of crazy and he forgets about it. He is fully dedicated to this state admission the next day. Um, and and if, has, I, if I can stop you there, just remind everybody, I, I've played that video ad nauseum from, from your reporting, but he starts getting booed by the crowd chanted fed fed someone who was posting it on another platform that had like one of those um, digital voices they called him an effing boomer so he got shouted down the day right. before right. and then and then proceeds on no, January I said, that's one of the most successful super chats of all time because the ray epps footage must have been seen like one of the most iconic pieces of political footage arguably in a, in a long time and that that one super chat shut the f up boomer whoever did that got his money's worth. <laughs> uh, the super chat heard around the world. But um, yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's pretty amazing. And you could argue, well, that alone isn't uh, illegal, which may be the case, but it's certainly, it's the type of egregious behavior that if he committed other crimes, even trivial ones, ordinarily you would think the government would go after him to make an example of him because his behavior uh, collectively was so egregious and the kind of similar principle, although in a very unjustified way, what they did to the shaman, you know, that a lot of people were inside the capital. Epps did not go into the capital, but a lot of people were in the capital, but they had to make an example of shaman because the footage was so iconic and ridiculous. And so when they, you know, approach the issue of kind of selective prosecution, prosecutorial discretion, you have to think, who were the people that kind of behaved in an egregious fashion such that they would want to make an example of them? And I think Epps kind of fits this bill because, again, he was the only guy very, very emphatically urging people to go into the Capitol on, on January 5th. And that became kind of iconic footage. He's there the next uh, day on the 6th. Now, he's given conflicting reports. One of a version I believe that he gave as to why he went to D.C. in the first place was that he had this bizarre premonition that there would be a terrorist attack or explosives or some kind of violence going on. And his son wanted to hear Trump's speech. And so his wife said, look, 
it's going to be dangerous for his son. So you need to accompany him, something like that. And so it's kind of on a whim, a last minute thing where he goes to accompany his son to the speech. The only thing is he doesn't attend the Trump speech. Instead, he's directing people to the Capitol. And ultimately, he ends up abandoning his son. He's not even with his son for most of his participation in, in January 6th. So that seems to call into question. But furthermore, if, if it was just sort of a on a whim decision to go to D.C. to do this thing, how does that explain how dedicated he seemed to be to this mission to get people into the Capitol? January 5th, he already had it in his mind and he was repeatedly, emphatically, methodically calling for it. Then on the 6th, he skips the speech that he ostensibly flew across the country to attend. The guy wearing the Trump hat doesn't go to the Trump speech. Instead, he's there in the morning directing people to the Capitol saying, and I'm, you, you probably have this footage, you, you know, it might be a good idea to play, he's saying, after Trump's finished speaking, go to the Capitol. That's where our problems truly are. It's in that direction. Spread the word, blah, 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 over and over and over and over again. And then, of course, he's prepositioned right at the site of the initial breach of the Capitol on the, on the Western perimeter. And it's, I mean, it, it, it's so egregious that he's standing there right at the bike rack and whispers into a guy's ear two seconds before the breach occurs. Here we go. I think it's this part right here. Um, and then I'm going to have a question for you after this. Oh, it's so over the top, uh, Darren. It's so over the top. But hold on. Y you said that um, he never entered the Capitol. Am I, I'm not wrong in understanding that although he didn't enter the Capitol, he was in fact in restricted areas? Where right. Well, that's another dimension. So the latest major piece that we did on January 6th actually covered the, the kind of the tragic and outrageous case of Green Beret Jeremy Brown, who was recently sentenced to over seven years in prison. And it's a story of the government using a trivial misdemeanor trespassing charge in order to cook up a more serious felony charge. In this case, felony charge, they Basically, the, the details of it, maybe in another context we could get into it, but it was one of these things where um, they created phantom January 6 weapons charges in order to justify a search that otherwise wouldn't have been legal. And on the basis of what they found on the search, they, they charge him with illegal possession of weapons, but... They removed the phantom charges linking the weapons to January 6th, which was the only basis on which they could have done the search. So long story short, they do the same type of gymnastics you see them doing in other sort of really aggressive, politically motivated cases, like, for instance, the Trump indictment. You know, the document charges, whatever they were, those were basically misdemeanor charges. In order to amp it up to a felony to circumvent the statute of limitations, they had to connect it to a phantom campaign finance violation charge. So very different context, very different type of case, but similar in the kind of contrived gymnastics they have to undergo in order to um, in order to prosecute someone. They did this in the case of Brown, but the anchor point was actually this trivial um, uh, January 6th trespassing charge. And Revolver News is the first to point out how ridiculous and malicious this whole trespassing issue is because in the Meet Ray Epps part two series, one of the things included in, in this shocking video that we compile is footage of people methodically removing fencing, indicating that it's a restricted area before right Trump's speech is even over. Oh, th that's a different one. So no, this one here, I just, I'm pulling up this clip, which is also from, I think it's from part one, but this yeah. is where they go past barricades. And unless I'm misunderstanding things, once they go past these barricades, they're in restricted area. Well, yeah, so they're already, you know, they can get closer to the restricted zone. So that's a case of it being obviously restricted because they're removing barricades and basically storming through. But the point is, is there were other areas that didn't have those bike racks but had fencing. And mm -hmm. there were people very methodically removing the fencing such that when the crowd 
was finally got to the Capitol after Trump was done speaking, they wouldn't even see the fencing. And so mm -hmm. they would be trespassing without even knowing it. So hundreds and probably thousands of people technically committed this basic trespassing offense. But the only the handful of people have been charged for it are people that, again, for one reason or another, the government wanted to make an example of. They wanted to make an example of this individual, this Green Beret Jeremy Brown, because of all things, he was actually a whistleblower, the Fed's direction. The feds tried to recruit him as an informant in early December for January 6th. And he said, no, he recorded it. And he released the recording saying, look, this is a you know federal infiltrated operation. And it was only after that that the feds basically decided to retaliate and cooked up the phantom charges that were anchored in the trespassing misdemeanor. But the point, the point with Epps, though, is that he didn't go into the Capitol, but he could very well have been charged with trespassing. It's a it's a silly charge, but it's a charge they had at their disposal if they wanted to inconvenience him or make an example out of him. And as pointed out, on paper, he's exactly the kind of person that they would want to go after. He's the guy in camo gear and a Trump hat directing people to the Capitol over and over and over. He's the former head of the Arizona chapter of the Oath Keepers, the most demonized and prosecuted militia group associated with January 6th. Um, I happen to think there are even more serious conspiracy charges that they could have um, indicted Epson, and there's an exact kind of precedent for exactly this model of charge. But even leaving that aside for the moment, they had a trespassing charge at their disposal, and they didn't use it. And that's sort of one element of kind of inexplicable uh, federal protection uh, that Epps enjoyed that was not extended to, um, uh, to others. Um, so, but no, Epps did not, to my knowledge, uh, go into the Capitol and a lot of sort of the unsophisticated, quote unquote, debunkers who say, Epps didn't go to the Capitol. Of course he was arrested. It simply ignores the fact that many people were arrested and charged with trespassing um, who did not go into the Capitol for trespassing and conspiracy who did not go into the Capitol. You know, it's amazing. I'm looking at one of my older tweets where I, I, I'm poking fun at 60 Minutes with that Ray Epps video, and I'm noticing I can't retweet that tweet. Hmm. I just uh, I asked, I asked Elon on Twitter why that might be the case. Um, okay, so, jeez, uh, I mean, his explanation, as per that 60 Minutes propaganda piece, was that as soon as he knew that he was on the FBI's most wanted list or, or wanted list from the event, he contacted them and said, I'm going to cooperate with you readily. I jokingly said, first of all, who, who has a direct line to the FBI unless he calls, you know, the Google number and says, hey, guys, I'm Ray Epps. I'm on your sign. Come and talk to me. But there were a number of other um, people who were convicted or people who were charged, I should say, who immediately collaborated, cooperated with FBI. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I got a two part question. Well, you, you the bottom line is you think Ray Epps is, a, is a, either an agent, an informant or. Uh, a, a, a remunerated agent provocateur for the government? Well, um, let me put it this way. Based on all the evidence that I've seen and based on the protection that he seems to have received from the government, based on the unusual sympathy that he enjoys from mainstream media outlets that otherwise are fully dedicated to demonizing anyone who said, you know, was remotely associated with January 6th. Um, I would say at the very least, I do not think that he was an authentic actor on that day. I do not think that it simply came to him on a whim, this kind of mission that he seemed to have to get people into the Capitol. I think that there were some third parties who gave him that idea. Now, so who those third parties may have been, um, uh, that's a matter of speculation, but I think there's, you know, do I think it's the FBI? Actually, I don't think he works for the FBI. I mentioned in, in a variety of interviews that before he retained this David Brock employee who actually, before working for David Brock, he worked for Perkins Coy, which is mm -hmm. sort of the Democrat machine law firm um, 
most responsible, I think it's fair to say, for cooking up. It's the laboratory in which the falsified um, steel dossier was mm -hmm. cooked up. And the, the fact that these would types of people would be bedfellows of Epps is just in keeping with the New York Times doing a puff piece on him and 60 Minutes. It's just very bizarre. But before Epps got this David Brock lawyer to intimidate Revolver and Tucker Carlson, he had a lawyer who was a nine-year veteran of the Phoenix field office of the FBI. And this guy went on this publicity tour telling everybody with an ear to hear it that Ray Epps was not an employee of the FBI, not an informant of the FBI, and he'd never been associated with any law enforcement agency. And he really clung on to this term law enforcement agency for dear life. Now, I believe that that's true, but if Epps wasn't, it's important to point out the Department of Homeland Security is not a law enforcement agency. Military intelligence is not a law enforcement agency. Any private organization that might do contracting work at the behest of any of those organizations would not be a law enforcement agency. So there's a variety of arrangements that could sustain what I think is likely is that he wasn't acting, you know, as authentically, he was acting on behalf of some other party um, for, a, for a malicious reason um, uh, that does not involve him working with the FBI. But again, that's simply speculation. The facts that we have before us, though, are here's the guy calling to go into the Capitol in advance. Here's the guy with the camouflage and the Trump hat who flew across country allegedly to hear Trump's speech, who skipped the speech and instead stuck with this bizarre, inexplicable mission to get people into the Capitol. Um, and we see the video evidence of what that's uh, like. Here's a guy who's texted his nephew saying, I orchestrated it. Here's a guy who's caught in multiple, if not lies, certainly inconsistencies in his various accounts of what he was doing and why he did it. Just for one example, he told, I believe, the January 6th committee, they asked him, so why were you telling people to go into the Capitol? His, his response is very bizarre. He said, oh, I thought it would be perfectly legal and they would just open the doors. Well, that's a weird thing to think, given the fact that there actually were instances of police opening the doors, but not exactly in that context. But also, it's totally disingenuous, it seems, because in the footage itself, he prefaces his exhortations to go into the Capitol by saying, I'm probably going to get arrested for mm -hmm. this. I'm probably going to go to jail for this. So that like directly refutes his later position that he thought it would be illegal when, because he acknowledged the illegality in his very statements on the issue. Um, the, I think he had another statement to the committee that, oh, once he got to that area with the bike rack, then he knew it wasn't going to be legal anymore. And at that point, he abandoned any idea of going into the Capitol. Only that seems to be contradicted by video evidence that Revolver compiled, and it's in the Revolver piece, of Epps in an exchange. And here's where I think, based on precedence of other conspiracy charges, the DOJ, if it wanted to, could have given him a serious conspiracy charge. He's talking to this other individual right at the bike rack. That individual, I believe, is holding bear spray. He's someone referred to by researchers as a maroon proud boy. And I think he did a lot of vandalism and he actually did go into the Capitol and so forth. And Epps says, when referring to the bear spray, when we go in, when we go in, leave this here. We don't want to get shot. So the when we go in indicates that at that point where he said he already abandoned any conception of him or anyone else going in legally, he's already saying, when we go in, leave this here. We don't want to get shot. And the fact that the guy he talked to actually did commit vandalism and I believe actually did go in, that exchange anticipating going in could very well have been a conspiracy charge. Would it have been a good charge? I don't know, but I can state for a fact that 
very similar types of exchanges had served as the basis of conspiracy charges in relation to January 6. In fact, this gets us to the Sicknick thing. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. All right. No, Dave, but one more thing. Yes, yeah, so we go up there? No. When we go in. Are we going to get arrested when we go up there? Yeah. You don't need to get shot. arrest us all? All right. I, I didn't appreciate the importance of what you just highlighted there. Okay. Right. That's a conspiracy charge, I believe, if the DOJ wanted. Now, it's important to put out a caveat qualify here. I think the DOJ has been really um, maliciously aggressive in a lot of its prosecutions. So I'm not saying like all things being equal, like in a in kind of a blank slate situation, should they, should they have, a, you know, aggressively do a conspiracy charge here? Probably not. But the point is that they've done conspiracy charges in, for very similar types of exchanges. And my point here is only to basically um, refute those who say, yeah, Epps may have been sort of egregious, but he didn't, you know, there was no nothing that they could have charged him for. And I'm pointing out that in addition to the trespassing charge, which they certainly could have, this particular exchange could very well have served as the basis for a conspiracy charge, especially when you look at how flexible um, they've been with using conspiracy charges on the people that they actually want to go after. So then there's a question is why don't they want to go after him? It seems like the same flexibility that the government exhibits to go after the people they don't like, they're displaying a similar type of flexibility to not go after Ray Epps. And then the question becomes, why are they protecting him in this fashion? It's, it's funny. You, you go after it from the angle of charges that obviously could have been brought had the DOJ been so inclined. That that's a no brainer. I, if, to me, it, like it 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 wake it, it awakens me to the fact that this would be an indication of some sort of pre planning where he says, "Look, we can go in, and so long as we don't push the envelope too much, nothing bad will happen to you. Don't worry. Forget about forget about worrying about getting arrested. That'll be the least of your problems if you get shot." So in right. advance, he said, this is how far you can go. This is what you can do without pushing that limit of getting shot. So telling the guy, leave the pepper spray here, um, but not telling. When him. we go in, it's like a fait accompli. Of course we're going in. Mm -hmm. It's happening. It's, it's not even a question. When we go in, leave this here. We don't want to get shot. So um, and this is, you know, right before the the initial breach, right before he goes up and whispers into the other guy's ear before the breach happens. You know, whatever he said to the guy's ear, I think it's pretty much immaterial at this point. They There, there is basis, I, I think, for charges. And the only question that remains is why, why are, is the DOJ kind of protecting him? And why uh, are all of these other institutions that are so uh, invested in demonizing and persecuting basically every other January 6th participant, why are they interested in protecting Epps as well. Like New York Times, you know, the, the point at which Ray Epps was one of the first 20 people on the FBI's most wanted list, the New York Times did this feature called the Day of Rage on January 6th. And, you know, they were trying to gin up this narrative of January 6th as the worst insurrection in the history of the world, worse than the Civil War, all that. They had so much footage that they could use to reinforce that narrative. Out of all of the footage that they had, they chose to use footage of Ray Epps in their day of rage. So it wasn't just the FBI. It's like anyone looking objectively at the footage, if you wanted to make a case that there was some plan in advance, the Epps footage is probably the best you could do. And the New York Times certainly determined that in the day of rage profile. And then something weird happens. Revolver starts talking about federal involvement. Epps is quietly taken off the FBI list. The New York Times goes from featuring Epps in Day of Rage to doing fully dedicated puff pieces on Epps that ask none of the basic and most pressing questions pertaining to his involvement. Where did you get the idea to go into the Capitol? Why don't you think you were arrested, Epps? 60 Minutes doesn't even ask him that, let alone, you know, New York Times doesn't ask him that. So it goes from the, you know, featuring him as the FBI's most wanted, demonized the New York Times as the ominous, you know, day of rage, complete about face. Adam Kinsinger, 
who's never met a Trump supporter, he doesn't want to see rotting in prison for less than 50 years, he's coming to Epps' defense. Uh, now yeah. Epps is getting lawyer. Uh, now Epps is, is, is tapping into the David Brock Hillary Clinton machine for legal counsel. How does this happen? Uh, it's fascinating. Uh, the one question, did you, did, I mean, I presume you watched the 60 Minutes thing. Did, did you notice how Epps' own explanation, he says, you know, we're going to go into the Capitol. And his testimony was, or sorry, his interview was, well, when I got in, I saw the people scaling the wall and I was, I was so ashamed of what I had done uh, and what was going on. He didn't say what I had done, of what was going on. I decided to leave. And yet after he leaves, that's when he sends the text to his nephew boasting about having orchestrated right. it. So like even by his own 60 minutes answers, it doesn't make sense because he clearly was not ashamed of what he witnessed because the first thing he did when he got out after witnessing what he was so ashamed of was text his nephew to boast about having orchestrated it. Um, are, are, okay. It's just fascinating. Are, are you, are still digging into this? Like this is, this is, you're, you're not, you're not letting up on this story and it, it's not letting up on itself. Um, no, uh, I, I think it's a, it's a story worth pursuing. Um, so just leave it at that. Both that and the pipe bomb are very much worth pursuing. But one thing I'd like to say about the 60 minutes issue, because I, you know, the 60 minutes segment mentions Revolver News five times. Revolver's reporting on Epps is the foundation of the entire segment whose purpose is to kind of repudiate mm -hmm. that reporting. They interview Ray Epps in a, I would say, on the whole, sympathetic fashion. Not only that, they interview some, you know, fourth-rate national security think tank guy. That was the real bizarre thing. They got some, you know, pudgy cheek guy with crooked teeth out of a fifth-rate think tank and label him a national security expert and they they say so what do you think about the Epps stuff he said oh there's no factual basis for this blah 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 if Epps was an informant he would have been the worst informant ever <laughs> give me a break they have this guy on and they don't have me on to defend the reporting that the whole segment is meant to attack and this isn't just saying, oh, how unfair this is, blah, blah, blah. Yes, it's unfair. Yes, it's not journalism. We know that. They're not journalists. They're janitors. They're janitors for the regime, and they did a mop-up job, but it was a sloppy job. These aren't even the A-list janitors. These are the night shift janitors, you know, on some special work program. <laughs> so, but, but the thing is about the fact that, you know, and the producer reached out to me weeks in advance saying, oh, you know, we're doing a segment on Ray Epps. It's largely based on your reporting. Would you be interested in an interview? So, so forth. And I said, sure, I'll, I'll do it. And the fact that they canceled that on me at the last minute really speaks volumes because it's not about, oh, you know, why won't they have me? It's not fair. Think about it from their point of view. Think of all of the home court advantages they have splicing and dicing, adding the right B-roll, contextualizing, finding naughty politically incorrect tweets that I did, you know, a year ago and using that to set, set me up. If I happen to make an especially compelling point, they could simply edit it out of the segment. They have a million tools at their disposal to make me look bad. And yet, even with all of those home court advantages, they decided that their case was so weak and so brittle that they simply couldn't have me on at all. I think that speaks volumes about the confidence they have in their defense of Epps. Um, and then again, it's the insult to injury is like, they, it's one thing they have Epps on to, uh, to talk, but to get this fifth rate laughing stock. I mean, I, I wish you had the footage of this guy just so you, people can see what I mean. Let me see if I can't find it real quick. Um, and while I hold on, let me see if I can't find, oh, that's not how you spell six. A fifth rate laughing stock from a think tank 
that is only the subject of ridicule because of its tremendous low status, who does consulting work for the FBI. So you get a pudgy consultant for the FBI to simply state authoritatively that there's nothing to the Ray Epps issue. Here we go. I got it. Okay, good. Let me minimize. Hold on. Do like this. Present. Yeah, if Ray Epps. Oh, first of all, it's not even true is the problem because Ray Epps did exactly what he needed to do and suffered no consequences as a result of it. Here. Let's see this here. My this is God, the, look. the evidence and dis decided not to disclose tens of thousands of hours of exculpatory video showing uh, the shaman, QAnon shaman, Jake Angeli being escorted around the Capitol by police officers. It's, it's, I like the analogy, like a, a sloppy mop-up job. I cannot understand how dumb, ignorant, or partisan someone would have to be to not watch that 60 Minutes interview on its own four legs and understand it's like, it's a crooked, it's a crooked, broken table. It's, it's the most outlandish piece of rubbish by its own reporting. To believe that he orchestrated it, I mean, there's just nothing there except for <laughs> video and a text message that he orchestrated it and everything right. we could see with our own eyes. Right. And the thing is, and then there's this completely stupid, specific focus on the FBI as though I've ever maintained that he worked for the FBI. We've already been over that. It's not the point isn't whether or not he worked for the FBI. I think the likely answer to that is no. The, the question is, where did he get this idea, this mission to which he was dedicated to get people into the Capitol? Where did that come from? Do we really believe that he just got that on a whim? And, you know, just, oh, I'm happy to be here because my wife said I should go look after my son. And then he's just, he gets this epiphany, you know, maybe, you know, Moses, uh, you know, God appears uh, behind a burning bush and says, hey, you know, you need to get people into the Capitol. And that all of a sudden becomes his all consuming mission. And he tells people to go in on the fifth and he skips the Trump speech on the sixth. And he's just all, you know, methodical and, you know, seemingly rehearsed and so persistent that just he just got that out of the blue and he came up with it on his own. Where did he get that idea? Number one. And number two, given that he was saying, I'm probably going to get arrested for this, I'm probably going to go to jail for this. Why don't you think you've been arrested? Why hasn't Epps been arrested? Why does he enjoy because, because he cooperated protection? He cooperated with the FBI, but when Brandon Strzok, for example, found out he was going to be arrested and then turned himself in, cooperated, etc., he got three months house arrest. He had to plead guilty to uh, misdemeanor charges. Yeah, right. every, I don't know. I don't know who didn't cooperate with the FBI once they found out that they were on a list. Oh, but but uh, no, but like Kinzinger says, he Ray Epps helped expose the lies of the of of Rep Massey. Did you see the tweet from uh, Kinzinger referencing Massey, where he said, I, "I hope you get sued by the man he trusted you." Did you see that tweet? It was very bizarre. The whole thing is <laughs> bizarre. The whole thing that Kinzinger is out there, like, you know, if you look at the transcript of the January 6th committee's interrogation of Epps, I believe there were two, actually. There's only transcript of one, which is interesting. But in the um, available transcript of the January 6th committee's interrogation of Epps, as I pointed out, it's one inconsistency after another from Epps's point of view. It's actually pretty incredible. I, I, I mentioned that he said, oh, I thought it would be legal to go in. Well, if you thought it would be legal, why did you say I'm going to get arrested um, for this? Why do you say I'm getting arrested for this? But the, it, it got even more ridiculous. At one point, um, he was asked, well, what about the part of the footage where people are you know, pointing at you saying fed, 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 fed? His re answer, I'm not making this up. You could go and look at the transcript. His answer to that was, I don't recall that happening. My son doesn't recall that happening. I think that that's doctored footage that could have been edited in. That's the level of delusion. I, I, I describe it like it's like the Shaggy song. It wasn't me. They caught you on video. Oh, it wasn't me. They caught you in the bike rack. It wasn't me. <laughs> it's like the you almost have to admire that level of chutzpah. It's like you're on camera. Oh, it wasn't. <laughs> they, it do doctored. Um, no, but I, I, I say it's 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 like Soviet level denial of 
Chernobyl radiation. It's like, oh, that's it's not that's not radiation. That, that's my analogy. Like the, the Shaggy song, now that you mention it, is another good one. Um, I need to get that transcript. And no, well, you know, he doesn't have to have. Did did did, did anybody FOIA? I mean, I don't know who could be FOIA'd for information as relates to finances of Ray Epps. You know, like who who put the idea in those unemployed individuals living in uh, you know the basement of a vacuum shop to kidnap Gretchen Whitmer? It happened at least for some to have been uh, the FBI. It happened to uh, have right. been the authorities. Uh, who who planted that idea? You, you've you've opened my eyes to the idea that he could be a DNC operative, and he's you know. Well, you know the thing is, is that you know that's that's all I maintain because there's a lot of room for speculation here, and I will say based on the research, based on the evidence, I can say you know it's still it's it's an opinion. I you know, I can't state this as a fact, but I'm strongly convinced. Number one that he was not an authentic actor, that he simply didn't come up with the idea on a whim by himself to get people to go into the Capitol. He's acting on behalf of some third party. Mm -hmm. That's my strong opinion. The question is who? And secondly, he's enjoying a very bizarre level of protection. And I happen to think that him possibly working for a third party or acting on the third party and the protection that he enjoys. I think those two things are very likely connected. The protection and, you know, where he may have gotten that mission to go into the Capitol or to urge people to go into the Capitol in the first place. Those two questions have never been adequately addressed. Um, I have heard no innocent explanation for either of those two that's in, in any way remotely convincing. Um, when you look at the case of Epps contextually in relation to other people who have been charged and so forth, and think about this, like he would have been a perfect poster boy for, for, the, for the evil Fed Sorex. Think about this. He was the former head of the Arizona Oath Keepers. If the media wanted, they could have crucified this guy. They could they, have they made could, an example of him. They could have declared the Oath Keepers a terrorist organization. Exactly. Based on they could have said, look, the Oath Keepers guy was the guy calling to go into the Capitol in advance. Think of how, how much incentive they had to, to add that to the list, given how much they were trying to demonize the Oath Keepers and so forth. They have a guy who was the former head of the Arizona chapter. For that matter, did the feds even like search him? Did they look through his electronics even to see if he may have had communication with Oath Keepers? We don't even know that. If We don't even know if he was subject to a basic search, let alone not, you know, not being arrested, anything like that. It's, it, it, I don't, I cannot, even if I'm putting on the devil's advocate, trying to, you know, represent the other side, I cannot come up with a remotely plausible, innocent explanation for the fact pattern that we see. I'm just looking to confirm because I don't want to make a mistake that, uh, yes, there were informants embedded within the Oath Keepers. So the idea, the idea that this individual, let me just get the archive link. Is this it? Here we go. The idea that it would have been inconceivable that he's an FBI informant. They already had informants within the Oath Keepers. So and actually, incidentally, Jeremy Brown, the agents that approached him, the guy who was who was just sentenced to seven years, as I was talking about his case where they used the trespassing charge as a kind of anchor point to give him more serious felony charges, um, they were trying to recruit him in relation to his association with the Oath Keeper. So the Oath Keeper is very much part of their radar. Now, based on what I've learned about Epps is I think he kind of severed his relationship with the Oath Keepers. I don't think he was, um, uh, you know, doing stuff with the Oath Keepers as pertains January 6th. But just because he wasn't, the point is, it would have been such an easy narrative for the media and the DOJ to use. And they're certainly not shy about unfairly using these kind of narratives in other contexts. So again, why does he enjoy that extreme benefit of the doubt, that extreme leniency? That's from, 
it, it doesn't make sense to me. It's not even leniency and it's not benefit of the doubt. It's overt protection and demonizing of anybody who comes to the obvious, rational and, and well-evidenced conclusions. Right, and that's the other thing is look at how aggressively the regime has attempted to close ranks on this narrative. When we first started reporting on the Fed's erection, the regime went absolutely nuts. And since then, it was basically like, I have to say, between Revolver's reporting and Tucker's amplification, the, the, the whole narrative about January 6th changed on a national level. And this infuriated the regime. This infuriated their lackeys in the media. And um, it's, they simply can't tolerate it. It has to close ranks because there's so much invested in this false narrative of January 6th. That was... The 9-11 they needed for the next Patriot Act. As ridiculous as it sounds like to compare 9-11 to January 6th, the comparisons are actually accurate and appropriate, not in terms of the damage, the destruction, the severity, the magnitude, but simply with a view toward how these events are used as a pretext for further abuses on the part of the national security state, they absolutely want a Patriot Act corresponding to the so-called insurrection in the same way they got the Patriot Act after 9-11. And in fact, they're reforming and repurposing the very institutions that were erected in the aftermath of 9-11 to persecute this new war against American conservatives. And you see it in the DHS, Department of Homeland Security, set up to fight the war on terror in the aftermath of January 6th. Now, in the aftermath of 9-11, now the DHS is the tip of the spear when it comes to the domestic war on terror, the war on people who uh, object to, you know, drag queen story hour, you know, open borders, um, uh, and, you know, Biden's general senescence. Um, so there is a lot at stake here with January 6th. And um, I think it would be inaccurate to say that, you know, the agenda has been stopped because they've been very successful in weaponizing the national security state. But nonetheless, we've profoundly delegitimized their carefully cultivated pretextual event to accelerate this trend to the next stage. And that's why they're so furious at me, at Revolver News, at Tucker. And that's, again, that's kind of stepping outside of the playpen. And that's why things can get so inconvenient. That's why it's hard to monetize. That's why we have full-time, you know, Soros-paid operatives, you know, acting like an obsessive, angry ex calling up every advertiser. That's the kind of reward you get for stepping outside of the playpen with this kind of stuff. And um, just as a last point, because I, I really have to go soon, but just as a last point about, um, you know, about Tucker, because, uh, because he's in the news recently and so forth, is just got to say is like, he was the only guy on American national TV who was willing to step outside of the playpen. And he was unique, not only with respect to his colleagues at Fox, he was unique with respect to the entirety of the media in the United States. And there are many instances on which he was the lone voice of opposition, the lone voice advancing an alternative view on absolutely critical issues um, of, sort of life and death importance to the American people, um, and to uh, and to the country, and so um, I suppose just given what we've become, the globalist American empire is only a matter of time before he had to be removed because uh, the lies are so brittle that they can't even withstand one guy for one hour on a prime time slot exposing them. But and, and, and despite despite how much money he made for Fox News, they also financially or politically could not tolerate it. Uh, Darren, one last question. Let me know if you can answer it. Mm -hmm. uh, have you received any lawyer letters from Epps attorneys? And to the extent you can mention whether or not you have received them, explain any of the content. And I don't know anything. So if the answer is no answer, no comments, let me know. But uh, 
if you can comment or if you can answer. No, I have it. I mean, again, they've been threatening for a long time. So far, we haven't received anything and I'm fully prepared, to, you know, if, if it comes to something like that. But again, it's like, this is a very weak leg for them to stand on because anyone with with a smidgen of common sense, looks at the case of Epps and knows how bad it is. Like if they were smart, they would do everything in their power just to memory hole it. That's what's so strategically ill-advised about this kind of redemption tour for Epps is they're better off just not talking about it because every time they put it, they kind of re-up it in the public consciousness, people look at it and say, that is weird. That is that doesn't add up. And, you know, even people who are being intellectually honest, even people who hate Trump's guts, who hate Trump's supporters, who think the idea that the 2020 election was stolen, they think that idea is absurd. People who think that the overwhelming majority of J6 rioters were scum. Even people with all of those beliefs, if they approach the issue of EPS with intellectual honesty, I mean, it's just right there in your face. Epps is the absolute weakest leg they have to stand on. So again, they tried it with the New York Times piece. It blew up in their face because it was such an egregious and sloppy mop-up job. And here again, you have it with the 60 Minutes. You think you think it's going to make it look better to do a whole segment on Epps because you got some fourth-rate think tanker with pudgy cheeks and crooked teeth? state authoritatively that there's nothing to the EPS issue, uh, who, you know, who does consulting work with the FBI. I mean, it just makes them look incredibly stupid and sloppy. So I think if they're smart, they'll just let the EPS thing go away. But who knows? They're I, not I, smart. There could be other things going on. So we'll see what happens. We'll see how it develops. Yeah, I, I think they're doing it to get people enraged so that people send him hate, harassment, threats so that he can then purport to be a victim. And then they could say, look how bad these Trump well, supporters are. But, you know, one other thing about him, of course, I strongly condemn any kind of harassment. Here's here's a weird thing. If, if, we, if we had just a couple more minutes. Go for it. Is, go for it. This is super weird. Super weird. The New York Times puff piece on Epps, uh, most of it is totally, you know, insubstantial, ridiculous, so forth. They're portraying him as this victim of Revolver News and Tucker Carlson. But there is a really weird line in there that talks about death threats that Ray Epps received from a Mexican drug cartel. Now I'm thinking the whole tenor of the piece is how dare Revolver and Tucker talk about Epps. He's a poor victim, blah, blah, blah. And then weirdly, seemingly out of context, there's this reference to death threat he received from Mexican cartels. It's like, is the suggestion here that cartels are such loyal Trump supporters that they're infuriated that, uh, that you know, Ray Epps could have been some like informant or something? Where does this come from, this cartel thing? Um, and it's really bizarre because the guy who wrote the piece, who's sort of their go-to janitor called Alan Foyer, he's, you know, quote unquote, expert on cartels. He wrote like the, you know, the CIA approved version of the history of the Sinaloa cartel and El Chapo and so forth. So it's kind of weird that the guy who does the cartel stuff writes this puff piece on apps. And then in the puff piece, there's this weird kind of out of context reference to death threats that Epps received from a Mexican cartel as though like the cartels are big fans of Revolver and Trump or something. I mean, it's it's a really it's just really weird. Um, but, um, you know, I strongly condemn any kind of threats, any kind um, I very much against it. Um, would not encourage it, would strongly discourage it. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's, it's just, it's very bizarre how, how this has come up. And uh, again, we'll, we'll just have to see how it develops. There's one other thing I wanted to say, but I, I just forgot. So I guess I'll just, well, don't, we'll save it for next time. I'm going to end the stream with you and we'll say our proper goodbyes. Darren, thank you very much for coming on, uh, enlightening all of us. It's fantastic. The revolver expose was the greatest thing. I'm going to go 
dive into the uh, pipe bombs one because I'm not as up to speed on that as I should be. Uh, but Darren, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to put all your links, send me your links, but I'll put up the links in the pinned awesome. comments so people can find you. Awesome. Everyone out there, I'm ending the stream on all three platforms because my wife is going to kill me as well. Uh, locals, I'll see you in a bit. Ending stream. Dar uh, Darren, stick around. We'll say our proper goodbyes. Everyone out there, peace out, people. Peace.